Also, everybody in additional seating, will you give them a shout too? We're so grateful that you are here with us today. Listen, I'm Daniel Gross. How many of y'all have been in a service with me before? Come on, wave at me. Okay. For those of you who don't know, in my fancy pants, I also go by white chocolate. All right. Pastor Jeremy is on another assignment. He's preaching in Springfield, Missouri today at James River. Ms. Jennifer actually ministered at the Women's Conference a couple of nights ago. How amazing is it? We have incredible pastors that have a local, a, a, a local reach, but also a global reach. How many of y'all are grateful for our pastors? Will you give our pastors, Pastor Jeremy and Jennifer, a massive hand? Super excited. How many of you guys enjoyed Pastor Christine Kane last week? That was incredible. Listen, if you missed that sermon, we encourage you, go back, listen to the podcast, watch it online. She preached a message about overcoming shame, and it was absolutely impacting. So go back, check it out, and continue to grow. Amen. All right, two other quick announcements. Uh, we have victory in Jesus. Amen. We know that. Amen. And also, we got victory in the Astros. All right. Come on, y'all. Going to the World Series. Super excited about that. And then my final announcement, because we have to give a plug. Where's all the ladies at? Wave at me. Come on. Next Sunday night. Say next Sunday night. Next Sunday night. Just the ladies. Next Sunday night. At, that was four of you. Next Sunday night. At 6.30 is ladies night. Come on. It's ladies night. And we have a very special guest speaker. We're super pumped about it. Pastor Jeremy called me last night. He said, hey, go ahead and just let them know. Just make the plug. Let them know. We got a really special guest speaker. So, okay, okay. So y'all excited? You want to know who the guest speaker is? It's Pastor Jennifer Foster. Come on, Miss Jen is going to be in the room, and it is going to be next level. Two weeks ago, we kicked off our Best Life series. How many of y'all were a part of that? Two weeks ago, Pastor Jeremy jumped into the Best Life. We took a break last week for Pastor Christine Kane. I'm going to stay in the Best Life series this week. Then Pastor Jeremy will actually be back next weekend, all weekend, to bring it in for a close. But we're going to be talking about the Best Life. And Pastor Jeremy referenced social media, and he said, you know, it became popular for a season. Still is a little bit. The hashtag, living my best life. Come on, y'all. I ain't gonna make it one with you. All right. No, stop it. We ain't singing that. We're in church. We just got done singing about miracles happen when you move. Come on. Healing is coming. Miracles. Y'all are pretty good. Heaven is living my best life. Okay. We can have fun in church. Come on. It's 1130. So y'all woke up. You're breathing. Has some premium espresso. We're excited. Living our best life. And Pastor Jeremy began to break it down. He talked about how sometimes we get caught up in the mindset of what our best life would be. And he talked about sitting on the beach and putting your feet in the sand and drinking a virgin strawberry daiquiri and a little, little, little umbrella in there. And I, my mind immediately went to, there's a lot of people with ugly feet. Like the toe with the little one sticking off to the side, and even though you put the paint on in the bedazzle bead, it's so awkward knocking little kids down on the beach. Like, is that living your best life? And he was talking about living your best life, and he said the truth is, living your best life is when you unlock, when your purpose is unlocked, and you're stepping into who God has called you to be. It's more about the legacy life. So we're going to stay in that vein of the best life. And listen, I'm a charismatic, fun. We like to shout. We like to have fun. I like to be fun. But the truth is, today's going to be a little bit more fundamental. And I know in my fancy pants, that's going to be hard to believe. But we're going to be a little bit more fundamental. And if you're new to the faith, this, this word is going to maybe be a little new to you. And if you're a student of the Bible, or you've been around Christianity for any amount of time, this word may be common to you. But I want to break down what the word stewardship means. We're going to be talking about stewardship. How do I become a good steward of what God has entrusted me with? Because here's the reality. God has an incredible plan and purpose for your life. And not only does he have an incredible plan and purpose for your life, but there are people's lives attached to your destiny. People's lives attached to your purpose. And I'm going to start in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. And we're going to break down stewardship in a minute. But I love this. It says, in their hearts, humans determine their course. That's us. In their hearts, humans determine their course. You want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Right? Because it says that it's the Lord that actually establishes your steps. Jeremiah 29, 11 says it this way. And this has become an anthem for my wife and I. It says this. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. That's good. See, I'd rather be smack dab in the middle of God's plan than all the way out here trying to figure things out on my own. Because at the end of the day, I've realized I'm still flesh. I'm not that great. God anointed Paul in the Bible and a donkey. I'm probably closer to the donkey. Come on, somebody. 
I mean, he took my hair to keep me humble. He said, I'm going to take your hair, keep you humble, I'm going to give you a great beard, and it's kind of made me cocky. Moving on, all right. <laughs> plans to prosper you, plans to not harm you, to give you a hope and a future. The truth is God has entrusted us to be good stewards of what he has planned for our lives. When we think about stewardship, it's kind of a poised, funny, responsible word. I've already lost some of you. You're like, is he talking about the USS stewardship? Like, what is he talking about? The word stewardship, and we're going to break it down for you. It says this. Stewardship means this. Using uh, God-given abilities to manage God-given resources, ultimately to accomplish God-ordained results. I'm going to say it one more time. It's using our God-given abilities. So that's your gifts, and that's your talent. That's why we're so passionate about four specific things here at Hope City. We want you to know God. We want you to find freedom. We want you to discover your purpose ultimately so that you can make a difference. Using your God-given abilities is who God has wired you to be. That's why we, we can't stress it enough. Go through growth track. Jump on and be a part of the dream team. How many of y'all are part of the dream team? Come on, wave at me. Amazing. Because it's not just about serving, man. We become a family. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Jump in and be a part of this family and let's do some serious damage to the kingdom of darkness together. Yeah. Using our God-given abilities to manage God-given resources. We've been entrusted as a church to use the God-given resources. And let me just tell you, let me brag on Hope City for a minute. This is a generous church because y'all are a generous people. Let me brag on Hope City for a minute. Four and a half years in, we've given away over $3 million to missions, local and global. That's amazing. Somebody should shout. That's incredible. In 2019, we will give way over, well over a million dollars to missions using God-given resources, ultimately to do what? To accomplish God-ordained results. Let me give you one more God-ordained result. Four and a half years, over th this is where y'all should shout, over 30,000 people have committed their lives to Jesus. That's a God-ordained result right there. Because we're being good stewards. So stewardship, when you think about it, instantly your mind goes, oh man, this dude's going to talk about money. I see what's happening. But giving of money and of your resources is a part, yeah, it's a part of stewardship. Oh, he's just going to be prompting us to try to serve and just be a part. And yeah, stewardship is, is, that's another part of stewardship is to serve and giving of your abilities. But we're going to break this down for a minute. What is stewardship then? Daniel, what, what's stewardship? How do I become a good steward in my life? Number one, and we encourage you to take notes here at Hope City. I, I say this a lot. I believe in repetition because it says, there's a study that was done that said, if you're a hearer only, you only retain 5% of what you hear. So the only thing you've heard is white chocolate and fancy pants, all right? But if you take down notes in real time, it goes up to 35% retention rate. If you take down notes and then go back and apply it, listen to the podcast, watch online, your retention rate goes up as high as 90 to 95%. That's an amazing study done by Harvard, Harvard Community College, but still. <laughs> so, write this down if you're taking down notes. Stewardship begins in the heart. It's on the screen, write that down. You can take a picture of it if you want. Stewardship, it begins in the heart. This is the foundation. This is where God is entrusting us with our time, our talent, our treasure, who he has wired us and called us to be. But it starts in our heart. Check this out in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says, guard your heart above all else. Why? Why do we need to do that? Because it says, for it determines the course of your life. See, your heart determines your actions and your actions determine if you're a good steward or not. Because it's not what you do for the Lord or what you give to the Lord. It's the heart of why you do it. Let me say it this way. Maybe you give. Maybe the buckets go by and you're like, ha ha, throw a bit in. Oh, praise the Lord. Or maybe you're the opposite and you're like, oh, reluctantly trying to give. I'm going to echo our pastor two weeks ago. He said, if you're giving without joy and you're giving reluctantly and frustrated and you're doing it with the wrong attitude, don't give. That's a pretty bold statement as a pastor. But we don't do things based upon our own opinion. And based upon the word, it says God loves a cheerful giver. Yeah. So if you're giving and you're sowing and you're doing it with the wrong attitude, then you're not being a good steward. Wow. Yeah. I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but if you're serving and you're a part of what God's doing here and you're like, man, I'm part of the dream team, but you're doing it with a bad attitude, you're not being a good steward. Because the heart behind stewardship is everything. Look at the person next to you and say, God, I have the heart. Let them know. Say, you have to have the heart. Look at the other person on the other side of you and say, you look pretty good today. Come on, you did all right. Because <laughs> here's the reality, and we've been saying this a lot in our all staff. I've been saying this a lot whenever I've had the opportunity to lead our all staff. I say, guys, we don't have to do this. 
We get to do this. It's a privilege and an honor to be a part. Do y'all realize we're in the middle of a revival? Do y'all realize we're in the middle of a movement? Like people walk in with broken marriages and leave set free. People have walked in with diagnoses and gone back and they've been reversed. People have walked in with addiction and left healed, set free and delivered. We're in the middle of a movement. So we don't have to do this, but we get to do this. It's a privilege and an honor. Well, why? Our why is people matter to God. So they matter to us. Our why is found people, find people. So our foundation is stewardship. Number one, it's all about, begins in the heart. Number two, write this down if you're taking down notes. Stewardship is for every season of life. Stewardship is for every season of life. You might be the youngest in the room, or you might be the Guinness Book of World Records holder, and you're the oldest person in the room. It's in every season of your life, but I think there's a massive misconception that says, I'll start being a good steward when I have enough. I'll start when, 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 when I have a little bit more. I'll start giving when I'm older. I'll start doing it when I figured it all out. And that's a massive misconception because stewardship is for every season of life. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 actually says it this way. If you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. The truth is, you have to look at what God has placed in your hands. I heard a lady, she literally, it's been a couple months ago, she said, I really wanted to be a part of the Silos Project, but I'm a single mom, and I mean, honestly, what I would throw towards it would be a few bucks, and it wouldn't even hardly cause a ripple in the massive lake, and I said, no, 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 be faithful with what God has put in your hands right now, and watch God pour out his spirit on your life. Watch him bring favor and increase to your house so that you can do more. I got a DM last night. Somebody slid into my DM last night and said, Hey, uh, I was at the service and, and, and my wife and I had been talking and God had been prompting us to give a certain amount. And we had been reluctant because honestly, we haven't been being a good steward of our resources, but God had been stirring in us to give towards the silos project and God activated our faith and stretched us today. And we're going to start sowing because we believe the favor and increases on our house and what God has entrusted us with. We need to sow into what God is doing here. Why? Because we're sowing into families. Why? Because we're sowing into future eternity issues and marriages and come on, breakthrough and healings and deliverances. We're sowing in to people being set free. So stewardship is for every single season. Yesterday, um, now my disclaimer, my beautiful wife is here and she's always like, if you're going to tell these stories, make sure it's not for a lack of discipline. So, okay, hold on. So our three-year-old is very strong-willed. She's a very strong, like we live in her world and she's very bossy. Again, it's not for the lack of discipline. We're not those white people that are like, Cody, simmer down. <laughs> Cody, don't make me count to 60 again, Cody. Like that's not us, okay? We won't go any further, but we're not going to talk about it. Cody, simmer <laughs> Like literally, I was in the grocery store the other day and she was like, this lady was like, 31, 32. Don't make me get to 40, 37. I'm like, simmer down. So our daughter Daphne is very strong-willed and uh, she said, daddy. And I said, what? And she said, daddy. I said, what? She said, I want a banana. I said, how do you ask? And she said, daddy, I want a banana. And then she said, please. I'm like, all right, you slipped it in there. So, so I went and got her a banana and I came back and she started weeping. And I'm like, what? I even peeled it. Like what? And she said, I wanted two bananas. So I went and got another one and ate it in front of her. All right, I don't know if that's good. I don't know if that's good parenting, but why are you telling us that story? Because I think a lot of times we approach God like that. God, this just isn't enough. I wanted more. And if you would have given me more, then I'll be a good steward. Then I'll bless others. Then I'll be good with it. But the Bible says to be faithful in the small things. It's every season of your life. If God can trust you with the little, I'm telling you, long term, he'll trust you with way more. Let's get preaching. I want to shift for a minute. I want to talk about being a good steward of our time. The Bible actually refers to time like this in James 4, verse 14. It refers to time in our lives like a vapor. It says that you're like a fog that fades away. So I'm going to talk about time for a minute. I want to ask this loaded question. How are you spending your time? That's loaded. People don't like to be told, like, oh, you're starting to step on my toes. Now, listen, I'm, I'm big on time. Anybody who works with me knows I'm punctual. 
Like I'm waiting in the room, like, where y'all at? And they're like, we still have four minutes on the clock. Because I'm kind of of the mindset that if you're 10 minutes early, you're on time. And, and it, all right. <laughs> she elbowed her husband. It's like, woo! <laughs> If you're 10 minutes early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're 10 minutes late, then you better have a really good reason. Now, now I, I know there's exceptions. I get it. My wife literally full-time pours into our four babies, but she also, I'm going to call you out. You also rock a shirt sometimes that says, sorry, I'm late, but I didn't want to come. So I don't know. So, so I get it. But my loaded question is, how are you spending your time? Are you a good manager and a good steward of your time Apple released a screen time feature. Has anybody experienced that? Where you get your weekly reports? Sometimes it's a little sobering. You're like, dear Lord. <laughs> yeah, but I use my phone a lot for work, but what about the 90 minutes a day that you're just on Instagram? How are you managing your time? There was a story about an older gentleman who was nearing retirement. He was an executive at a company, and he rode the bus Every day, he just loved that, loved it. He said at the bus stop, and he would open up a book and just read. He had done it for years, and there was a 20-something-year-old intern who was just starting in his career, and he'd been riding the same route with this man for, for a while, and he finally slid over and said, hey, introduced himself, and he said, I can't help but notice that you've been reading, I think, that book a lot. Like, you open it up, and you're constantly reading that book. Is it, is it a really good book? He's like, because I've never seen you with your phone out. Like, like, I'm on my phone all the time. You know, FOMO, like fear of missing out. And the guy's like, I don't know what you're talking about. But he's like, I've never seen you like on any phones or listening to music. You're always reading. This older gentleman looked at him and he said, you know, I learned a long time ago, son. I don't want to kill time. I learned a long time ago that I want to embrace every moment. I learned a long time ago that I want to experience the wonders of life. And even at my age, what, 55, 60 years older than you probably, I can still be growing and I can still be learning. I want to make the most of my time. How are you managing your time? How are you spending your time? Let me ask this one. Are you getting enough rest? Are you being a good steward of that? Well, I sleep four hours a day like a Marine. You're probably not a Marine. <laughs> and if you are, thank you for your service. But if you're not and you just aren't being a good steward of your, are you resting? Are you a good steward of your time with the Lord? Or do you show up and you break the glass box on the wall that says break in case of emergency and throw out all your list of things that you need accomplished and say, God, I need you to show up in this? Or are you being a good steward of your time in his presence where you just sit and listen? Because again, if this whole thing is built on religion, it's a waste of time. This whole thing, Christianity, what we walk in daily with the Lord is not religious, it's relationship. Are you spending time in the presence of God? Are you being a good steward of your time. How are you managing your time with your family? How are you managing your time between work and relationships? How are you managing your time between are you serving or aren't you serving? How are you manager, managing your time being planted in the house of the Lord? I love this saying. My wife and I, when we first got married, you know, we had talked about in life we're going to go through things. That's Bible, y'all. John 16, 33 says, in this life, you'll have trials and sorrows of many kind, but take heart because I've overcome the world. This is Jesus's words. So Jackie and I just celebrated 15 years in July. All right. <laughs> Curtsy. It's amazing. 15 years in my family, that's a big deal. In her family, that's a big deal. 15 years, a big milestone. She reminded me yesterday, you ain't buying me. You didn't upgrade my ring or nothing. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But we had this thing where we're like, listen, in life, we're going to go through things. If we go through it, then let's grow through it. Let's choose to grow through it. And I love this acronym. And I love what the older man said earlier when he said, I want to experience the wonders of life because time, the acronym says things I must experience. You're going to experience some things that stretch you. You're going to encounter some things in life that shape you and refine you. And sometimes it feels like, God, where are you? But there's some things that God needs in the process of preparation, there's some things that you need to experience. You know, David would have never become the king if he wouldn't have taken the head off of Goliath. But check this out. He would have never taken the head off of Goliath if he wouldn't have fought the lion and the bear first. There was a process in the preparation. Things I must experience. I want to grow. I want to experience the wonders of life. There's nothing more special than watching my kids growing and developing my six-month-old learning and exploring and seeing things that he's never seen before and almost fully ripping my beard out like he thinks it's fake. 
but I love watching him and I'll just sit and we'll watch our kids experiencing the wonders of life, things I must experience, being a manager of our time. You know, managing your time right though could be completely connected to your purpose and your destiny. And I'll tell you a quick story because some of you don't know this story of how we even ended up here. There's a lot of you, if you've been in Hope City for any amount of time, you just know I've been flying in and commuting here for years and preaching. We just, I'm like the weird cousin who just shows up. But there's a backstory to this about managing and being a good steward of my time. So I am not, I'm going to openly admit it. This is a public intervention. I'm, ter- I'm a terrible administrator. For years, I thought I was. And then my wife's like, babe, you're not good at administration. I'm like, yes, I am. She's like, spell administration. I'm like, <sighs> and she's like, let me help you with your schedule. Let me help you manage your time and your calendar. And there was a conference that I was supposed to be speaking at in Ohio. And honestly, I was going to bail on it because I was overloaded. That particular year, I had flown like 180 something times. I was saying yes to everything, preaching everywhere, singing everywhere. And I was just overloaded. And she said, let me manage your time. And because she put in place something that aligned my will to God's will in my life and my time as a good steward, I was able to go to this conference. Now watch this. Pastor Jeremy Foster's there. I didn't know who he was. He didn't know who I was. It's probably six and a half, seven years ago. We're at the same conference. He decided to come to the night that I was preaching. We ended up hanging out till like two in the morning and he began to talk about dreams and we began to talk about hopes and dreams and what God wanted to do. He began to tell me about them, some things in his heart to do that we're literally living in the middle of right now. Things he was prophesying then, we're in the middle of now. And he said things like, man, I like you. I was like, I like you too. He's like, you're cool. I was like, you're cool. He's like, we should hang out. I was like, we should hang out. We should hang out later today. He's like, okay, you're getting a little weird. Like, it's almost like a stalker a little bit. He's like, man, it'd be so cool one day, wouldn't it, if we were like a part of this together? And I was like, don't you threaten me with a good time. But I believe that something was solidified in the spirit and in the covenant. And I believe my wife, my four babies, and myself, we're in Houston, Texas today, living here because of that moment, because I was a good steward and managed my time. It was all connected to my purpose. It's all connected to our destiny, how you spend your time. I believe a lot of times how we manage our time is almost like a GPS, a supernatural GPS, helping us get to our destiny. Number three, as we bring this in for kind of a landing, number three, stewardship requires willingness. Now, this is tough. We, we don't like to be told what to do with our time a lot of times. We don't like to be told what to do with our money. That's a big deal. We don't like to be told how to parent. My wife and I, when we first married, went to a restaurant called Logan's Roadhouse, you know, where you can just like throw peanut shells and really anything else. Like, I've got lint and everything else in my pockets. Like, you can just kind of throw it everywhere. It's a hot mess. And so we were there and we were eating with this couple and they had a little girl and we, we didn't have kids yet. And so we were sitting there and their little girl, or they ordered her a hot dog and she was trying to bite into the hot dog and it literally shot through the bun on the table, rolled off the table under the table. I was like, oh. And so I was trying to get the waitress's attention and the mom was like, that would take way too long. So she's digging underneath the table. Like, I'm like, you're really working hard. Whatever you're touching. Like, Oh God. And so she reaches and she pulls out the hot dog and she's like, mm. <sighs> and she's like, parenting's messy. And she's blown. And I'm like, and then she pops it on the bun and hands it back to her daughter. And I was like, oh, that's not okay. That's, <laughs> but people don't like to be told how to parent. I was like, I don't think that was a good parenting move. And she's like, what'd you say? Like, you don't think it was, a- <laughs> you don't even have kids. And like, Things got super weird. I don't think we talked to him since that day, but uh. (laughs) willingness is a massive deal. Why? Because free will is involved here. That's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, verse 6, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Because if you, that's a choice to position yourself under the mighty hand of God. And it says this, and he will lift you up. Stewardship requires willingness. It actually reminded me of the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. There's this moment where the master gave five bags of gold to one man, and he came back with five more. There's another man he gave two bags of gold to, and he came back with two more. And then there was this third guy. Don't be like the third guy. Matthew 25, verse 25, the third guy said with his one bag of gold, I was afraid, so I went and I buried it. The maker of the world 
The creator of the universe has entrusted each and every one of us with skills and gifts and talents. He's entrusted us with resources. And if you allow fear to grip you and muddy the waters of your faith, you'll end up like the third guy and you'll stay in a rut and never reach your full potential. Write this down if you're taking down notes. Don't bury your potential. Release it and live by faith. See, we're called to live by faith, not by sight. And when we allow God all access into our lives, we can release ultimately what's in our hearts. Y'all, I'm sweating like crazy up here. I might start wearing a toupee to catch it. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> Get ready for it. We're like crunchy bangs. <laughs> Just. So I was in Dallas a couple months ago, and uh, I love it. In Dallas, <laughs> you're a Dallas Cowboy fan as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. I was in Dallas a couple of months ago at a conference and I was staying in the hotel by myself and I'd, I'd been wearing this rubber band around my wrist and there was this moment where I was just really candid with the Lord, super candid with the Lord. And because again, this isn't re religion to me, it's relationship. It's like a father to a son. So I was really honest, like, God, there's some areas in my life that I'm, I'm feeling super stretched in, like super stretched, like to the point where I feel like I'm going to break. Like I have to be a good husband. I, I, I need to be a good Dad, I need to be a good leader. And I'm feeling super stretched to the point where I feel like I'm about to break. And I felt the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says that the Holy Spirit is our helper who helps. The Holy Spirit is always speaking. Sometimes we allow distractions in life to muddy the waters of his still small voice or the gentle nudge or the intuition, but he's always speaking. And I'm standing there and I'm stretching this, having this honest son to father conversation like, God, I feel like I'm going to break. And I heard the Lord say, Daniel, a rubber band is only valuable when it's stretched. It has no value sitting in a drawer serving no purpose. A rubber band's purpose is to be stretched. And the stretching that I'm putting you through, the stretching you're in now, it's not designed to break you. It's actually designed to shape you. It's actually designed to refine you. It's actually like a slingshot ready to launch you into what I've called you to. So I've given you everything you need, the new strength, the renewed power, everything you need to activate your faith in the stretching. We were at All Staff, and I mentioned this to our staff, and one of our lead team pastors, Pastor Oric, he's from Nigeria, and he came up to me afterwards and he said, Daniel, do you know the physics behind this? That's not a super good imitation, Pastor Oric, but I'm staying with it. When you pull on it, it never goes back to the original design. And I said, what? Think about this. When God stretches you, he never puts you back to where you were originally. No, 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 no. Why? Because he's making room for more. Audacious faith. He's making room for, for more because God is not a forcer, but he's a filler. And if you'll make room and you'll allow the stretching to happen inside of this willingness, ooh, he'll fill every time. And then he doesn't stop there. He says, listen, if you will pass this stretch, then I'm going to upgrade your faith. Come on. How many of y'all like getting upgraded? <laughs> you ever been on a flight and they're like, Mr. Jenkins, like you're all the way back in group four by the lavatory and they upgrade you <laughs> to first class and you're drinking coffee in a glass bottle. You're like, I wonder what the peasants are doing back there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You get upgraded. God begins to stretch your faith and says, listen, I need you to step outside of your comfort zone because the comfort zone is only comfortable, but nothing ever grows there, right? So when you're stretched, God will begin to say, listen, there's some creativity that I want to unlock in you. There's some things that, yeah, but God, I, I feel stressed and I feel overwhelmed. And Pastor Christine said this last week, sometimes we get in the comparison trap and we say, yeah, but... She's so much better at that than me, or he's so much funnier than, than me, and, and they, they seem way, they're hap, they have, they're way happier than me, and, and they seem that they're the happiest, and, 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 and you start kind of getting in this comparison trap, and God's saying, no, 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 I've got plans, and I've got purpose that I want to unlock in you, but in that stretching, this upgrade place, I need you to step into it. I believe God is about to unlock some things in people, and you know you've needed to serve. You know you've needed to connect and be a part of what God's doing here through the dream team, but maybe reluctancy or maybe old church hurts has kept you from stepping into it, but allow God to stretch you and upgrade you today so that you can be the daughters and sons that he's called you to be. Come on. Is that good? Come on. We have to get our yes out of the way. Let's just say that out loud. One, two, three. Yes. One, two, three. Yes. We have to get our yes out of the way because this is the first step. 
not designed to break you, but designed to upgrade you. And then there's one step further. I'm going to have my boy Shita come out here. Come on, the Nigerian sensation. Come on. Shita. Okay, that's enough. That was ridiculous. Like Ebony and Ivory in perfect harmony. You're like a Nigerian G.I. Joe doll. It's amazing. And single. Okay, moving on. So we went from here and we passed this stretch and we allowed God to stretch us here, but then God's like, listen, I have so much more. I, I want to expand even more. And if you allow me to grow you through audacious faith and you'll step out in the more, I I'm going to increase your faith. And in that stretching, and I had this thought, maybe you want to be a part of what God's doing in the silos and you say, God, but I can't do it on what I'm making. So I need increase and I need some favor. I need you to come out here and I need you to, yeah, this is increase in favor right here. Come on, give my boy Jude a hand right here. Come on, increase in favor. And then you're like, yeah, I, I want to be a part of this, but I, I just felt timidity and I, I felt anxiety about this, but I need some courage and, and I need some wisdom and I need some clarity. So I'm going to have my friend Megan come out and be courage and wisdom and clarity. Come on, jump out here, Megan. Give Megan a hand as she comes. And then I need joy. I want to complete this task with joy. I want to be in this thing and I want to be the one that walks into the room and has a there you are, not here am I sort of personality. So I need joy. I need my boy Ethan to come out and represents joy. So check this out. In the very beginning, it's you going, God, I feel stretched. I feel like I'm going to be broken. And because of your faith, God expanding your faith and stretching you to a new place and then ultimately putting you to a place where it is beyond your bandwidth. It takes the lid off and says, listen, there's miracles in this place. There's freedom in this place. There's audacious, extravagant giving in this place. But you have to allow God through willingness to stretch you. Give my friends a hand. Be, all, be real careful with that stretch. Come on. I believe that if we'll allow God to really stretch us out of our comfort zones, I'm telling you, if you could only see back in the day, high school, when I thought I was John B. Come on, somebody. See, you don't know who John B. is. Just Google him. I used to thought I was going to sing and travel and be the first white dude to cover Christian R&B songs. And <laughs> Lately, have I told you I love you? Come on, Tyrese. <laughs> white people don't know anything about that. Let's <laughs> just move on. But God began to stretch me and begin to say, listen, I've called you to do evangelism through worship. I'll give you a platform, but all I want you to do is get in the way of people's storms and point them to me. You know, at the end of the day, when we're stretched, God will stretch us outside of the comfort zone and stretch us into a place where our faith grows to the point where we just say yes. Well, how do I, how do I grow in this? When you get a revelation from God, it will fuel dedication to God. When you get a revelation from God, it will put you in a position where you say, God, beyond anything, I will stretch my faith and I will begin to say yes to you every day. I want to shift gears for just a moment. And I want to talk about generosity for just a moment. And I know some of you are like, oh, great. We're going to talk about money. But this is something we have to talk about foundationally as a church because, again, we're a, a generous church. Two of the definitions of the word generous that I love. It says liberal in giving, and I love this one right here, one who is open-handed. John chapter 3, verse 30 says, I need you to become greater and greater as I decrease and become less. And what, what we're saying in this is God... I'll live an open-handed life where you can take anything out and pour everything in because God's not trying to get something from you. Listen, he's trying to get something to you and ultimately through you. My wife and I, when we heard about the Silos Project, we said, listen, we need, we need to sow into this. We need to be a part of this. And we prayed and we came back and we said, this is what we're going to sow. This is what we're going to pledge because we truly believe. I believe this with all my heart. You know, we closed on the property. How many of y'all know that? That's amazing, right? To our soon to be first permanent location, soon to be, but it will be the first of many, many to come at 10 and Beltway 8. And in, in, in real estate, location, location, location is everything. And they said that over 550,000 cars drive by this location. If you do the math, one to three people in a car, over a million people are going to drive by the silos property every single day. Well, that's amazing. That's, that's great in the natural. No, 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 but it's so much more spiritual than this. I believe in Exodus chapter three, when Moses was tending to the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and he was just walking, minding his own business, a burning bush 
is off to the side and it says that Moses turned aside and when he turned aside, God began to draw him in and called him by name. I believe this with all my heart, that the Silos Project right there at 10 and eight, over a million people a day, I believe it's a modern day burning bush to the city of Houston. That people are gonna drive by and turn aside and mir mir miracles are gonna break out in their families. Miracles are gonna break out in their physical bodies. Addictions are gonna break out because Romans two verse four, I said it earlier, it says it will draw a man's heart to a place of repentance. So if you're on the fence and you're like, man, I, I know God's been asking me to sow into this. I know God's been asking me to be a part of it. I'm gonna echo our pastor who says, we want 100% unapologetically, we want 100% participation. Well, I don't have that much. Be faithful in the small. Hopecity.com slash give. Again, we'll never manipulate you. This isn't in the middle of the night infomercial sort of spiel. Like, if you give now, you're gonna get a free set of Ginsu knives. Like, it's nothing like that. You might get a ShamWow, I don't know. No, but we're sowing into good ground. We're sowing into something that literally is gonna produce hope and life for people. And here at Hope City, we never ask for a specific amount ever. We just say, God, tell us what you want us to do and then simply be obedient and follow through on that. As a church, we trust God to meet the need. We do not measure our resources against what's needed. We measure God's resources against what's needed. And I believe with all my heart that if we do it with joy, we're gonna do some serious damage, I said it earlier, against the kingdom of darkness, and we're gonna romance a lot of people to the heart of God. Do you believe that today? Come on. All right, one last thing. I wanna do one last illustration because we had so much fun with Shatah earlier. Shatah, come back out one more time. Hey, 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 hey. All right, that's enough. I was gonna give you another song, but I changed it up. So uh, actually, can we get Shatah a seat? Is that cool? He's been doing a lot. A lot. He's got the G.I. Joe shirt on and stuff. Let's just, you work out, buddy? So, you know, I have to eat tangerines sometimes to keep my energy up, Shata. You know what I'm preaching. I happen to have a couple on my podium. And I want you to hold one of these. Actually, hold both of them. But I want you to hold them pretty tight. Like, don't let go of them. Just keep a grip on them. This is representing Shata's money. This is his paycheck, time away from family. This checking account, premium $84 in the savings. Come on. Like, you know what I mean? You're there and you're, they swipe the card and it says processing. You're like, come on, Jesus, push it through. <laughs> Hey, push it through, Lord. Processing, air, try it again, swipe it again. The chip is worn down. Try, processing approved. Hey, it was approved. Oh my God. We hold on to these things so tightly and we're afraid to release it because what if we don't have enough? This is what the Bible says. Again, not my opinion. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God will generously provide all you need then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. But it's really difficult when, when you're holding it so tightly and you won't release it because I'm afraid that I won't have enough. Jeremy, I think you, wow, you happen to have a, an entire bowl of tangerines. It's amazing. It's like this was planned. <laughs> he loves tangerines as much as us, bro. But because you're holding on to it so tightly, God stops by and says, hey, man, I want to I bl bless you. But you're like, well, man, I, I, can't, I can't grab them because I, I got to hold on to everything that's mine, Lord. And we end up missing out and blocking the blessing because, again, God's not trying to get something from you. He's trying to pass something through you. And he will always bless you. And it says, and give more than enough so that you can be generous to others. But Shatai, I need you to do something bold because I know, again, you're, this is everything you have. I need you to just release What's in your hands, man? Just drop it. Just release what's in your hands. Now, the skeptic, the naysayer says, look at this. He doesn't have anything left. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give to others and it will be given to you. You will receive a full measure, a generous helping poured into your hands and all that you can hold. The measure you use for others is the one that God will use for you. I'm telling you, and this is Bible, if you will release what's in your hands, God will bring a backdoor blessing and he will release what's in his hands. And there are doors opening and favor opening in Luke 2.52 moments where God, Jesus have favor with both God and man and you will too walk in favor with both God and man. So yeah, you might have missed a couple moments, but God will keep on blessing you and he'll keep on blessing you and he'll keep on bringing the increase to your life so that you can be a good steward and be a blessing to others. Again, I echo our pastor that says, if you don't give with joy, don't give at all, because the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Give with joy.
You started with two. You missed a couple blessings, but now you have 12 premium bags of tangerines and you have enough to give to others. So when you release what's in your hands, God will release what's in his. Will you give our Nigerian G.I. Joe sensation a huge hand? Thank you, my friend. Enjoy the vitamin C. You'll never have scurvy. All right. Would you stand to your feet as we fully bring this in for a landing? Stewardship. It all starts with the heart. Stewardship. It's about every season we're in in life, from the youngest to the oldest, from the lean seasons or more than enough in your account. And then stewardship is about willingness. God will unlock generosity in you in the stretching. God will unlock so much more through your life. Don't lie dormant. Don't bury your potential. Don't hide your purpose. Step into what God has called you to. I'm telling you this. I told Pastor Jeremy this the other day. So we, we don't need something extravagant to happen. It would be amazing, but I believe everything we need is in the house. Thank you for your overwhelming enthusiasm. I believe everything we need is in the house to fulfill the call to do what God has called us to do. Will you lift your hands as a sign of surrender and across all campuses, additional seating? Well, why do I need to do that? I want you to do a quick selfie, a quick snapshot of your life and just ask the Lord, Lord, is there any area of my life that I haven't been a good steward in? Maybe it's my time. Maybe I've been stingy with my gifts. Maybe I've known for a long time I need to jump in and serve, but I've just kind of stayed on the sidelines and honestly, maybe a little lazy. And I just haven't stepped into what I know that I'm supposed to. Maybe the last part, and you say, I, I've known that God has called me to be a full-time giver. We're all called to that, but he's given increase to my business or into my family. And I know that God is asking me to sow, but the truth is I, I haven't been a good steward in these areas. Will you just begin to ask God to shape, identify, and show you areas that you need to grow in in stewardship right now? Just right now, just ask him. It's between you and him, sons, daughters to the Lord. And then just simply obey. Do as he asks and say yes to what God has called you to do and become. If you believe it today, give the Lord one more shout of praise. Come on, come on, come on. All right, one last thing, and then we're going to wrap this up completely. The reason we do all of this, the reason the band showed up early and rehearsed, the reason Dream Team was here six, seven hours before you arrived, the reason why we turn on air conditioning, thank God for air conditioning, right? As soon as I moved here, I started putting it here and behind the knees and just, it's hot, y'all, it's real hot. The reason we do all of this is for people. We do this because it says the heaven rejoices if just for the one that surrenders. And here at Hope City, we never pray prayers for symbolic reasons. We truly believe what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, when it says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, or you're the second invitation, you say, Daniel, something in my heart has been convincing me of the fact all day today that there's more to life than the way I've been living. I got caught in the prodigal life, but today I want to rededicate my life. Close your eyes just for a moment. Across all campuses, additional seating. If you're here, I'm going to count to three and just, just, I want you in a moment to just lift up your hand if that's you. You say, Daniel, I want to get my life right with God today. I want to surrender my life to God today. I want to rededicate my life today. One, today's my day. I'm going to give it all I'm going to give my life away. I'm going to surrender it today. Two, I want to rededicate my life. I want to make things right with Jesus. Three, if you're in this room, additional seating, additional campuses, lift your hand right now, right now, right now. Man, hands are going up all over the room. God is about to meet you. Heaven is leaning in your direction and everything is about to shift in your life. From our camera team to our team on the stage, I want everybody to pray. Say this with me out loud. Say, Jesus, here I am. I surrender everything. I've been living for me and it hasn't worked. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. I ask for forgiveness for my past issues, my struggles, and all my sins. And from this day on, I'm going to live for you. I confess you now as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on.